Hello. Hello, hi, how are you? Good night, good night. We met in the airport. Working perfectly. You write down the Okay, it says, uh, if there is a problem, I have my computer with me. Oh, but, okay. uh, and there is one short uh, connection with YouTube if it's possible. Okay. A video, otherwise, uh, we will see. If there is no time, I, I will. Uh, without me, because I make the connection with YouTube to see your presentation. Yeah, and there's also, um, I mean, in my thing, I think, oh, you have it, yeah, I saw that, yes. Yeah, Thank it you. will be on YouTube too, ah. your presentation. Thank you. It, it's here, in this room, right? It's connection, uh, Zoom and YouTube. I, yeah, I, I, I got it, I send it mm -hmm. to people who are interested. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can you see it? Oh, interesting. Yeah, it says, uh, mm, did see. Did see. Yeah. Okay. Take it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it works. It works. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. 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 Słucham? Yes. Where are you? Tak. Słucham? Tak. Słucham? Tak. Słucham? Tak. Słucham? Tak. Słucham? Tak. so yeah that's the problem Ja mogę wziąć ten mikrofon od ciebie. Dobra. 
Nie, mam nadzieję, że nie. Nie, nie, nie. To jest sam tylko działa. Wszystko działa. Nie so we did a Ola, teraz potrzebuję twojej pomocy. Hello, hello, ty wiesz, jak to działa, pomóż mi. To, mikrofony. Rozumiem, że to było w normalnie. Nie, nie, nie. Nie, nie, To jest nadajnik. No, to to. To nie, to. Poczekaj, poczekaj, poczekaj. Co mamy tutaj? Tajny kabel o z tym spekiem. No. Tym, tamto jest bardziej do ładowania, a gdzie masz czeka? Widziałem, że coś się na tym jeden coś. Włączę wszystkie niektóre. Dobra, tylko jeszcze sprawdź, bo ty musisz zobaczyć, czy w Zoomie go złapało. Ja ci okażę. Czy Są programy, leżą, pani profesor, przed 207 salą programy. Można sobie wziąć program. Tak, i długopis na y, 206A. Wszystko. Nic nie działa. Tak. Elu, a to co to co które to powinno być? Które to powinno być? Ty bierz mikrofon, tak, bo on spróbuj tak? ten, tak, bo on się, jak jest przez to, to on nie będzie rozpoznawany jako konkretny. Sprawdź, czy ty. 
Potem możesz... Co mogę sprawdzić? Nie, nie wiem. Podczas głośnik. Halo, halo? To nie wiem. Halo, Um, 
Weise die Single-Class of Edwin and Origin, that is the one, but I mean, we have not the end of the and they are like yes. Yes. yes, but you know, in my book, exchange of it, you see, charging like one place. Okay. Oh, we are charging for like, I wait for the 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 Yes. 
He was a You should, you should see it because uh, if you like, oh, yeah. it to the zone, yeah, it's uh, the end. Mm -hmm. Oh, it has we full speed. To the zone, you should sit here. Okay? Oh, okay. But if I want to share something like this, or like that. You may have a very Yeah, I think. No, I have this. I can like that. Yeah. Okay. I usually use it from Arabia. It's from <laughs> One time I left in Germany and I went crazy. But fortunately, the uh, ship is very far. I was very careful. <laughs> Wait, but that also yeah. making yeah. Yeah. But also it's yeah. making yeah. Yeah. So I can uh, uh, sit back with, with this microphone. Oh, oh I see. Just a moment. Yeah. 
But you mean I can't put the microphone here? Yeah. Yeah. The next slide will be here. Yeah. In that. Yeah. And here. Uh, That's really like, yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, great. You, we can wait, we can wait, we can wait. Okay. Are you very, are you finding you are very on time? Oh, because they wait, no problem. Yeah. Oh, my mother is one. It's my mother. Oh, great. There's only one person who comes to well, is there? That's true. Right. Can she hear me then? Can she hear? Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. So they don't see me through the screen, right? Good. So that's Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's time to start to begin our uh, lecture. I have the great pleasure and honor to announce and introduce our keynote speaker um, and honorable guest, uh, Dr. Kristantinos Politis, uh, who is uh, one of the most important and distinguished researchers in the, for sure, in Jordan, but in the other countries as well. Uh, I'd like to say that he gained his education in different countries, of course, in Greece, but also in uh, Belgium, United States, Britain, and for years he collaborated with the British Museum from 1988 until uh, 2011. Uh, and as a result, there were many several uh, archaeological sites excavated by uh, him, both in Jordan and in Oman. Uh, he excavated uh, different uh, chronological periods, starting from Neolithic sites uh, through Bronze Age uh, cemeteries, uh, Iron Age, also Nabataean fortresses, Roman ports, um, Byzantine uh, settlements, Bethlehemicas, uh, and also a Muslim, uh, uh, on the, for, uh, also sugarcane factory from Islamic period, which is uh, early modern but brilliant one, really, uh, as refers to its technology. So, so really a great ach achievement, in my opinion. Uh, of course, uh, one of the best known and uh, biggest achievements is uh, uh, Lot's Cave and the monastery of uh, uh, in the vicinity uh, from Byzantine times. He's also the specialist in this period in early Christian, the early uh, Byzantine Christianity. Uh, nevertheless, he, as I said, uh, excavated several uh, different uh, sites and uh, uh, as a result he is uh, one of the best specialists in the ancient times but even in the proto-historic uh, times as well in Jordan but he not only finds uh, he was not only the finder of the archaeological uh, archaeological sites but also the founder of the uh, museum at the lowest place on earth so it's also one of the best, uh, biggest achievements of uh, Konstantinos uh, politics. I'd like to say that, uh, that uh, he's also the great uh, curator of the uh, relics, ancient relics and the heritage. He managed to shelter uh, many uh, archaeological sites, mosaics, uh, ruins, uh, uh, buildings, and so on and so on. All in this situation when, uh, in, in which uh, uh, the heritage is in constant danger. It is uh, all the time endangered by the local diggers, or bulldozers, and many other uh, threats. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, say that we should we should uh, uh, should remind remember about it and remind it uh, of course. 
Dr. Politis is a research professor uh, at the Ionian University, but also the chairman of the Hellenistic, Hellenic uh, Society uh, for Near Eastern, Eastern uh, Studies. Uh, but uh, I'd like to underline that, uh, first of all, he's a very friendly uh, man, really enthusiastic about the problems uh, he's dealing with. And uh, he is he's also very uh, fervent personality. Uh, therefore, uh, I have to say that I, I believe that he will, he will share his enthusiasm with the audience today. Uh, and so I have a great pleasure, once again, and honor to, to ask him to start the lecture. We know the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, the great University of Warsaw. Is this okay? You can hear? And, yeah. and um, for my new friends and colleagues, some a few that I've known for a little bit longer, but uh, mostly it's a, a, a new uh, a new friends here and new colleagues. And I'm very happy to present this lecture, which I will go beyond uh, just an academic or or or. Um, uh, a report on an archaeological site or sites, but to try to fit in with your theme, uh, you know, archaeology today, the realities, and what we have been doing and what we can do in the future, uh, inshallah. Uh, so I, I perhaps I've taken a little bit, quite a big uh, area, which is the, the Dead Sea. It might seem like a specific area uh, for those of you who don't know. The, uh, the Levant, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Israel. Um, but it's actually very rich in archaeology for 13,000 years. So I give a survey. I will mostly concentrate on the classical periods, uh, the uh, Greco Roman, Byzantine, and early Islamic. But it's um, showing you the experience that I have had and with my other colleagues and the experience that we will have now and in the immediate future. So this is a view, a uh, helicopter view of uh, the southern part of the Dead Sea called the Southern Boar, the Southern Valley in, in, the, in the town of the modern town of the Royal Safi or uh, ancient biblical Zoar, Zawara. And what you see here is, um, is this riverbed. Uh, it's a wadi, it floods when it rains, a very typical Middle Eastern uh, phenomenon uh, where you have uh, seasonal flooding. And it, it's called today the Wadi al Hasa, but it's associated, I think, fairly clearly with biblical Zared. So we have biblical Zohar, biblical Zared and uh, other sites in the area. So that's what you see here. It's been the focus of our work, but I'm going to talk about many other sites in the area. Um, so first of all, now this is, this photographs are blocking the thing. I don't know if you can take the mask, but anyway. Uh, first of all, I will show you the area, the aerial satellite view of the Dead Sea area, this valley beginning from Tiberias. So this is an unusual view. I, I, it's not even usually think of. You look from north south, but it's a very, um, a very good way of showing you how this this uh, Dead Sea, which is shrinking, it's it's, it's uh, slowly going down because of evaporation, because of the water being taken out from down on both sides. But you can see the geographical position from the north going down to the Red Sea and uh, into. Um, Egypt and other parts of, of the region, but it gives you a nice view. And on the right, the first uh, survey of Eastern Palestine, it is now the top, the northern part of the Dead Sea. And this was done by the Palestine Exploration Fund in the late 19th century, where they made the first maps of the area of Palestine and also what is now Jordan, but they would call it Eastern Palestine. This was mapped and done uh, by hand. So it shows a very um, old system, but a very accurate system of, 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 of surveying and mapping. Of course, this was done by military um, 
uh, British military, and it also had political reasons because the late, well, 18th century, late 18th century, 19th century was still part of the Ottoman Empire. So the British had uh, interests in the area, and mapping the area was a very important part of the kind of strategic uh, uh, interest. But they use that, they use the cover of historical and biblical studies. If you look at the Palestine Exploration Fund, which is the oldest institution of the area, the study of the area, they use this kind of cover to, uh, to basically spy on the Ottoman Empire, putting it very bluntly. But uh, they did excellent work and they've laid the foundations for all the work that we do now in uh, Palestine, Israel, and, and Jordan. Uh, now, the geology is very important, and uh, here we have again at, the, at the, the, the floor of the Jordan Valley by the Dead Sea, you have an excellent uh, section of all of the geology of the area, and it's very important for us to understand the geology uh, because many of the archaeological sites are located at different locations, but it's also interesting because uh, you know, the, the basis of archaeology is George Lyell, layers, particularly whatever is lower, is, is, is older. But in this case of the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea Valley area, it's almost the opposite. So instead of having the youngest things on top, uh, you actually have some of the oldest uh, periods uh, on the upper layers, and the youngest, which is the that one you'll pass of the river alluvials and the old Dead Sea, the Rasan deposits, only 12,000 years ago. Whereas the ones on top are older, even up to 100 million years or, or, or more. So the geology is fantastic here. And it's important to understand it because we're looking at um, human settlements for at least you know, 12, 13,000 years. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's the beginning of our studies is the geology. It also affects more modern studies, such as um, doing a, a thin sectioning petrography on pottery, for instance, because you can identify the different uh, mineralogy of pottery and you can work out if it's coming from this area or some other areas. For instance, we had um, uh, some pottery which we definitely identified coming from, uh, uh, from the coast of Lebanon. Uh, because of the geology and, of course, other pottery coming from other parts of the East Mediterranean. So geology is important. Uh, geology and topography or uh, geomorphology uh, is, is also very important in understanding and identifying settlements, uh, human occupations and uh, settlements. This, again, of course, is the Dead Sea area. The Dead Sea, uh, the classic outline uh, of Dead Sea before it began to drop about 50 years ago. And uh, this also shows the different uh, uh, earthquake movements within the Jordan Valley. And if you look at the, uh, the geology of the Jordan Valley, of the uh, well, Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea, you find that it hasn't just opened up, it's also gone north south. So you get uh, geological features on one side that would link up, well, here it would link up there. So it's, it hasn't just moved across, but it's moved north south. Anyway, all that is very important in understanding uh, why there are certain human settlements, like these are the early Bronze Age, Numera, Safi, Baba uh, Dra, uh, why they are here. And it's basically because you have springs, fresh water. So, very very logical, but if we're looking for archaeological sites, the first thing we, we have to find is 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 uh, is the um, uh, fresh water. And uh, one of the features is that on the east side, on the Jordanian side, on the east side of the Dead Sea, there are more archaeological sites than the west because the way the rain falls, you get more rain falling, what I understood at least, falling in the east, and therefore, some 50, 60,000 years later, it comes out in springs or, or, or these wadis as fresh water, so you can have human occupation. So there are actually more number of sites on the east side of the Dead Sea than there are on the west. And again, it's understanding the, um, the, the geomorphology, the typology, the topography, and, and the geology. 
Now, this is a, a study that was done uh, in Israel for some years uh, ago, but it's very important because it shows the original Dead Sea. You see here this gray outline, how much bigger it was. I mean, basically, the Sea of Galilee, all the way down to almost Aqaba, Mali Araba, was one big lake. At one point, they called it the Lisan Lake. Um, that compared with the um, with the uh, uh, annual rainfall going back to four or five thousand years ago shows uh, us that many of these settlements by the Dead Sea uh, were related to um, uh, the annual rainfall, and that's been recorded from chlorine of the Dead Sea. We're working out, or they worked out. Uh, the amounts of, of rainfall and from polynological studies. And this morning there was a, a lecture on, or several lectures on the on central Anatolia, the uh, sites there, uh, and the fantastic work that's being done here by your university and I think other Polish scholars on the uh, the uh, polynological and climate studies. And this is the kind of thing that we look at also. So the peaks here, where it's wetter happen to correlate, and it actually also correlates to central uh, central Anatolia in modern Turkey, where around the birth of Christ, Roman period, it's the wettest and consequently have more most settlements. Uh, and then there's a drop, and uh, around the year, well, it's, is this around the Crusades? We have the Crusade especially here, around 9,000, just before the Crusade, it seems to be very dry. And then it goes up again, and this is the period where we have the uh, uh, medieval kind of uh, indigo and sugar industry. So looking at the, the rainfall is very important, and looking at the polynological studies are very important. And I think you know, the Warsaw University in Poland you understand it very well. I mean, um, now looking at a, a, a satellite image of, of what the Dead Sea used to look like here. Uh, and this map, which was produced when there was a peace treaty with uh, between uh, Israel and Jordan, and they marked many of the cultural uh, sites that were supposed to make this uh, Dead Sea, um, the Dead Sea uh, Park, cultural park. Uh, this was during the time uh, of King Hussein and Jordan, and um, uh, uh, the Israeli um, uh, Prime Minister, which I now forgot his name, the late, uh, and they tried to develop this as a cultural park and as a theme, the Dead Sea. Um, uh, not Yitzhak Rabin, um, he was the Foreign Minister. Uh, anyway, doesn't matter. The, the point is, during this peace treaty that they had between Jordan and Israel and Palestinian areas, of course, they uh, developed or they marked all the cultural sites that would have been of, of, of importance to um, Timon Perez. That was it, Timon Perez. So this is a very a nice volume that they produced during the time, I think, of his uh, the presidency. Uh, the presidency. And uh, it picked up, it, it highlighted how important the Dead Sea was as a kind of a cultural, historical part. Unfortunately, it didn't really move in that direction, even though there is a peace treaty, but. Um, you can see many of the sites here marked on the map on the left and the right. Now, looking at some of the biblical, biblical um, associations to the Dead Sea area, we have many uh, biblical episodes. The most famous, Lot, Lot's uh, family here on the left, escaping the destruction of Sodom and going into what is now uh, the Borisaki or the Wara. And uh, another great biblical story being. The, um, the Jericho story, the taking of Jericho and the walls you see here crumbling. Anyway, this has been associated with certain Bronze Age periods. It's difficult to identify exactly when, but there are many large Bronze Age settlements in the Dead Sea area, um, even though the dating 5,000 years ago may not be correlated very well with some of the uh, biblical interpretations. The fact is, the archaeology is that we have uh, many uh, important uh, uh, cities of this five, five, four and a half, five thousand years ago, Bronze Age, early Bronze Age, with uh, such you know pottery that you see here, and even imported Egyptian objects such as this uh, anthracite bowl on the left. These are objects which are actually all in the museum, by the way, in Saudi. They enjoy the back. The Dead Sea, the Mandal map. 
Okay, it's being blocked by the image. I don't know if there's a way we can get the image. <laughs> um, but it, the, the Gorosaki is just there. Um, if you turn off your camera, uh, we can see behind you. I'm not sure if you understand. Uh, can you turn off your camera? Oops. Anyway, it's just here. It's Laura, Laura, there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this is Zawara Murasaki, surrounded by palm trees, similar to that photograph. Up above is the um, uh, is Lot's sanctuary of uh, Lot. Very well located, the area we're working. But for the north, there is also Kaliroi. There is images of Jericho, which are off this map, and other sites along the Dead Sea. And here there's an inscription which actually says the Sea of Asphalt. Uh, and the, the, the city, uh, the, 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 the sea, the palace of, 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 uh, of the Dead Sea. So it's basically identifying this Dead Sea, and there are two boats you see here with some kind of um, uh, interesting uh, uh, carriage. They're carrying something. Okay. All right. Now it's stuck. Did I do something? I know. Okay, so in that boat you saw on the Dead Sea, one of the boats had this white stuff. It seems to be that you know salt was a very important product of the Dead Sea, and uh, in fact the Dead Sea was very interesting. In was an interesting place for many people. I showed some Egyptian pottery. Egyptians were certainly interested in the Dead Sea for its asphalt, its bitumen for for, for uh, embalming uh, the mummy, but also for waterproofing boats and pottery. So the other big product here is salt. And you see here in modern, uh, today in Warsaw, the people of the Dead Sea uh, are collecting salt. Um, and in Petra, uh, I saw some, some years ago bags of salt was brought, that were brought up from the Dead Sea. So a very important uh, ingredient. Salt is cheap today. Uh, but it's a very important part of 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 of, uh, of, well, of of one's diet and one's life. And I know that here you've got great salt uh, uh, mines in the south of Poland. Again, very important resource. And uh, there are Romanists here, which which can explain to you the meaning of salary in the Roman period, being a very important part of the way that Roman soldiers were paid in salt. And bitumen, which I just mentioned, or tar, this is found in the Dead Sea. This is a piece, uh, a large piece, which came out of New years ago. Uh, and as I said, it's used for waterproofing boats, pottery, but also for modification. So there was always an interest in getting this, this bitumen tar. Uh, something which is less well known, and you get in the Dead Sea areas, the dry areas, is pure yellow salt encased in, in uh, gypsum salts. So this had a very important um, uh, uses for both uh, burning, irrigation, medicinal purposes, and also for bleaching a cloth. But it's also interesting in the story of the Bible when they talk about bribe stones and the destruction of Sodom, that we have these balls, which are basically fireballs, sulfur. So probably the ancient people saw this and they made up the story of how Sodom was destroyed because we have these in the ground. Uh, so interesting that natural resources, the natural features which are explained in some biblical passages or historic passages, uh, right. Now, one of the greatest sites in the Dead Sea, we're now on the Western side. Uh, I probably don't have to tell anyone what this site is, even though it's labeled Masada, the great fortress and palace of Masada overlooking, it's just on the other side. Of, of the eastern Lisan Peninsula, this great uh, fortress uh, and a reconstruction of what the palace, uh, or what the palaces would look like. A uh, very important site historically uh, in the Roman period, uh, important for the identity of the modern Israeli state, but in our archaeological, uh, in for archaeological interests, uh, there were, aside from lots of Pottery, fantastic wall plaster, and mosaics, kind of Hellenistic type of mosaics and late Hellenistic mosaics, were textile fragments. And there were many thousands of 
textile fragments such as this one here, which is part of a Roman flabby, I think. Uh, and you'll see a little bit later in this talk uh, why our area in Jordan, which we've been working at, have, um, uh, have associations with this. And the person working on the inside of textiles is also the person working on our textiles. But obviously a very important site, one of the best known sites of the Dead Sea of the Roman period. And not very far, a little bit farther north on the west side is a site called Ein Gedi, uh, This was known again through Roman sources as being uh, a, a place where they produced this, this very uh, soft after uh, 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 balsam oil which is basically was used in, you would find it in glass and pottery vessels in the Hellenistic and Roman period in, 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 in cemeteries, but it was also uh, used as oil ointments. And even today you have uh, balsamic oils, not balsamic vinegar, but balsamic oils that are used for um, perfume and cosmetic. It was a very important area where it was produced. We know historically, that uh, I gave you in, in the Roman period was a big production center and all of it sea. So an important uh, production site. I think in, in modern uh, modern days it's called well the Latin name is Apericum or San Saint, Saint John's Wort, which you can actually buy probably at the chemist's pharmacies here even today. Um, now, the trade network of the Dead Sea, now focusing on more in the, the south, but obviously very important. Um, mostly important uh, is the uh, caravan uh, networks east west um, uh, going to the big the big uh, ports of, of, of Gaza, Rafa, uh, and on the Mediterranean coast. So this was mostly uh, done uh, by camel caravan trade and across in the south, particularly uh, across the Negev. Where you have one of the biggest tribes or the biggest Bedouin tribe, the Sidonian Bedouins, which still cross over and come across into the Jordanian uh, uh, eastern side. And here you have one of the Sidonian Bedouins about 10 years ago with his camel caravan in the area of Numera, which is just here. And then, of course, this, I think, rather famous uh, caravan rider. This is coming from Syria, but it shows the idea. Of a camel and um, um, a camel caravan um, cross uh, way of transportation. Okay, um, a little bit now on the east side, the east side of the Red Sea, we have a number of sites, less known sites, such as um, uh, two just at the mouth of the Wadi Mujib. The Wadi Mujib is uh, uh, biblical Arlon. And this was the, it's the biggest valley, uh, wadi uh, dividing modern Jordan. It was historically also the dividing area, the border between Moab to the north, the Moab to the south, and Amal to the, to, the, to the north. It was also the beginning to the south of Provincia Arabia. It was also Palestinian Tertia in the Byzantine period. So it's constantly been an international border, except for today, which is all part of the modern Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. And at the edge of this, you had uh, a couple of sites, the watchtower and a temple of the Nebuchadnezzar Roman period, which was surveyed by Jordanian and Alexia uh, Akiat. Uh, uh, and there's also a monastery on the, um, on the other side. I have never been up there. Uh, Robert Chick, which some of you know, I mean, we've tried several times to, 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 to even to think about climbing up there, but we haven't been. I don't know the condition of this site, but it's planned, it's known, uh, and it's a strategic point here where you're dividing is major, it's a major international border, as I said, for several thousand years, but very difficult to access. The other thing I'm going to say about this is I have to move on is you see this kind of uh, uh, soil that has been washed out from this big wadi coming to the west. But there is, you see how steep it is. There is no human settlement here, except for these kind of uh, rock, uh, high hilltop forts and temples. But there's no major uh, occupation here. So on the east side, there is no other occupation 
um, uh, as a settlement uh, uh, on the east side of the Dead Sea coast. This is the only other one, uh, except for the word Safi, which I'll talk about in, in a moment, is Ayn Zara, which is basically a harbor. Uh, it's not much of a town, but it was a harbor, and again, another palatial complex which was which was excavated uh, over a couple of years by the German Archaeological Institute. Uh, August Strobel and uh, Christa Kramer did excavations there. I spent a few weeks there before I twisted my leg. Uh, but um, And this is now a port that was excavated uh, a few years ago by the Department of Antiquities, unfortunately not published or even studied. Um, but an important site called Kalibroi, uh, which is a good spring, a very good hot springs. It's also uh, connected uh, with uh, another site called the north, the site of Maheras or Mahiram. Um, what I'm been, what I'm standing here is interesting because it's a, it's a street with little shops on either side, and it's very similar to uh, Ein Gedi. So these two sites, east and west, are parallel. Um, I would like to do some more work here, and we could even do some. There's even the potential for underwater work here. So, but uh, uh, this is what the Germans have published, and they also found a road going up to um, Macau. And this is Macau. So, this is this great site, kind of comparable to Masada, not as big, but that's Macau. And this is the road, uh, Kaliroy is down there, hot springs of Kaliroy. And these were connected. And there's a, there's a there's historical references that King, not only King Herod and his relatives uh, uh, went to the Kaliroi Hot Springs for medicinal reasons, but also that this was the site, the great site, uh, uh, Roman uh, 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 New Testament site, where uh, where uh, Herod built this, this, this hilltop palace. And this has been excavated by our friend and colleague, uh, Gozovorish, I pronounce it right from Hungary, with the support, great support of, of the um, uh, uh, biblical Franciscan biblicals, they're basically the, 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 the Vatican. But before that, Michele Petrillo and the Italians, uh, Marino, had worked there. So there is a history of, of working there, from the, particularly from the Franciscan. They've not really much excavated and, and published this, and, and it's, a, it's a great site. Uh, a little bit up from the Dead Sea, but it's connected with the Dead Sea because of the Kaliroi site. And it's also the site of the great kind of where Salome was, Salome danced for King Herod and the story about how then she asked for the head of the John the Baptist. So it has this great kind of biblical or New Testament uh, associations. Uh, and uh, again, even this reconstruction shows you how, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this site, but how classical Greek, the architecture and the mosaics and even the dress was of the period of the, of the Romans and the Jewish Romans, Jewish, well, Jews at the time, how they dressed and the architecture uh, was very classical Greek in its, um, in its styles. Now, moving directly across from Kali Roy, uh, on the west side, we've gone west again, sorry, I may confuse you a little bit, is a small but not very well known site of Kibbut Mazin. This is technically in, in, in time. Uh, it's not in the Israeli part of Israel. But anyway, uh, this was excavated and it's a, it's a classic port site. They found, as you see here, coins, uh, which help date it to the first century BC, the same period, and anchors. And the reconstruction here seems to be fairly accurate. And it's connecting again from east to west, from, from the, um, the site we just saw, Macaris uh, to, uh, to Kibbut Mazen, and immediately above it, I'm not going to mention that, it's a little bit too far in, is Herodium, uh, um, uh, uh, no, sorry, the palace of uh, Herod's palace uh, south of Bethlehem, yeah, Herodium, is that right? But, um, that would have been a port, the major port, or a port site leading to the west. And you can see here that they even reconstructed some camels caravan. So the camel caravan, there's boat transport, 
across the Dead Sea and can handle caravans where, where, where it's possible. Um, okay, now we're getting to the um, more controversial stuff. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered by many of the treasure, basically. And uh, um, just, I mean, they're just simple people. They came across eating as people have done all over the place. And they came up with a cache of, of, of scrolls. These are a couple of them. They're mostly in Hebrew, Aramaic, and some in Greek. Uh, over the years, more came up unofficially and were sold in the market in New York, and eventually the Israelis recognized their, well, the Israeli archeologists and the government recognized their importance and bought them and brought them back. And they're in the, mostly in the Israel Museum. Some are in Jordan, uh, but they're mostly in the Israel Museum. And as you probably know, there's the book of the shrine, the shrine of the book, which has many of these there, but it's probably the most controversial find from the Dead Sea, and they even call it the Dead Sea Scroll. And originally they were found technically illegally. They were sold illegally. Um, I have a reference that I've published which says that they were actually offered to the royal family of Jordan and they, uh, yeah, but that didn't, that, that didn't come through. But eventually they were bought by the Israeli government and they're most of the Israeli government are in Jordan. So very controversial. Uh, now there are hundreds of these pieces that have been excavated legally by archaeologists and published and are continuing to be published. And this is the cave, some of the caves, the Qumran caves, uh, where these were found originally by the Bedouins and then later by the archaeologists. Very difficult to excavate and to find. You have these, these are the, now we're going back to the geology that I showed you in the beginning. These are the what I call laminated morals, layers of the old Dead Sea, the sediments. They're dry, you can see the lines, as the Dead Sea dropped, uh, it dried up, but that, that was the, basically the sediments of the old Dead Sea. But the interest now for this site is not the geology, but that they were easy to carve, to cut into, and that's where many of these caves, the Qumran caves, the Kibbutz Qumran, uh, that these many Dead Sea scrolls were found. I misspelled the scroll. Sorry. Or did you? Anyway. <laughs> um, these are some of the copper scrolls that were found in the jar. The, the scrolls are basically parchment rolled up. But they're rolled up and found in copper jars. These were some of them that were they were, were in Jordan and they're in uh, they were made of copper, not just not just in paper. And the two types here are very interesting. And you'll see now, uh, because there's a cemetery of Qumran below, they're kind of cut and uh, uh, and kind of a, a sideways, they put the, the body to the side of it in this kind of arcosolia. Um, and uh, this is now another part of the power, which is very interesting. Because uh, in the Jordanian side, these are now the cemetery of Qumran published and the, 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 the alignment of the tombs are here and they're very similar the alignments of the tomb of the site of the Kazan in, in, in Jordan where we have worked. Um, and we're looking at comparing what we have compared to Qumran. Um, but before we get to that side of Kazan, we have uh, another uh, series of caves and, and scrolls that were found in what's called the Babata Archive. A very important one. There are also there are a number of other caves which had scrolls. There's a series of caves or other Dead Sea with scrolls dating from the first, second century AD. Um, and one of them in Babatha, Babatha was a lady who, uh, a wealthy lady, when she died, she uh, left a will in, in, in one of these uh, caves. And it mentioned Zawara, it mentioned the site on the east side where we've been working, would continue. Um, so we're making the connection now east to west. So one of these uh, uh, archives, the so-called Babatha archive, though, mentions property that this lady Babatha had uh, on the, on the um, eastern side. And now, we are coming now to um, the east side and 
what I think is the map that I have about to publish with what I think is the fort uh, of, uh, of, of this period of the first century AD. And this is the site of Kibbut Gazel and a number of other sites of the period which are related to the, uh, the archive and the, um, the exodus actually of, of the Jewish people from, from, from Jerusalem. So what we have first is uh, a site which now is inland. Uh, the Dead Sea would have been much closer. And I think that's this, the fourth site of Mahotza, which is an entrance in the Baba archives. As I say here, modern uh, Haditha. We visited that, some of us, uh, in December. It's now full of houses, unfortunately. But as you can see here, like, there was archaeological material. That was an Ottoman fort, which is also now destroyed. From here came uh, two, you know, uh, perfectly preserved plates, a helmet, which is now in Amman. And down below, just here, uh, rescue excavations and deal the uh, high cost Roman baths. And so this was the first, second century AD Roman site, which had been devastated by uh, human modern whoops, by modern human uh, occupation. Uh, and it brings us to this problem of modern people living in the site and how you deal with the archaeology. Well, in this case, this is one of the sites that virtually destroyed. Uh, it's above it were tombs. Many of them have been looted. Most of them have been looted. It's hardly a site to visit. We tried to visit and it was like depressing. But this is when the human um, uh, growth of human settlements destroys sites. Now, uh, this is the same. Uh, this is no, it's, it's a little bit farther south in what is now called Zawara. That, what I just showed you, the Bay of Hanita, and what I think is the southern port of Mahotza is here. And this is the site of the, the cemetery of Kibbutzon. This one here is the aerial photograph of, uh, of, the, of the area. Uh, we found, well, I found what I think might be an anchor, but I can't find it on the site, but it's somewhere there. Uh, but there is time definitely to make a connection with, with the West and East. So we're in the East. There's another helicopter photograph of Lor Madra, or possibly what I think is Mahatsa. And this is now a 1992 aerial photograph. You see here a nice clean area, police post here, the governor's office here. A 1938 British mandate map, which locates it and mentions a, a, a farmland of Haigazon, an Armenian from Kerak who owned the property, but no archaeological scene, no archaeological indications, and certainly just nothing to be seen in 1992. Uh, we used to drive through here to go to our project, and uh, during the time, we began to see the people were digging and they discovered something. And here it is. You saw the photograph before, it was untouched. Uh, we began a rescue project here, again, sponsored by the British Museum, which was one of our sponsors. We recorded as much as we could and did some archaeological work. It turned out that this was a very I think, important and fascinating site. But obviously, the two Roberts got there first. This was their tools. We confiscated their tools. In fact, they had very good tools. We used them for our excavations. <laughs> and we also talked to little people who are all two lovers, and they told us how it worked. So they would take this, uh, this poker and they would put, you see these holes, they would press it into the ground, and where it was soft, that's where they had dug, and then they would dig their hole. So these holes are where they're testing. They're testing. Uh, this particular piece I took to the British Museum and I've given it to the British Museum for their ethnographic collection. The others are not. But I thought this was you know, quite nice to give to them. And it wasn't really antiquities, but it, 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 it shows how the two are. Now, I cannot find this depiction, but there is a depiction from the 19th century, Italy, they call them tombolada, and they had exactly the same thing poking in the ground. 
It's a, like a drawing, it's not a photograph. I, I'd love to find this. So please help me to try to find this drawing of the 19th century showing them in Italy doing the same thing. So we're talking about realities here of archaeology, right? This is supposed to be the topic, uh, not just the traditional reporting. So we not only, or I, and we not only follow the tomb robbers, which are just ordinary people, but we ended up employing them because we started to dig and we couldn't find it. And then we said, okay, we'll employ them. And they found it right away, immediately. They found the tomb. So this is our department of Antiquities car, and this is us here, and a friend had taken airplane took photographs of us. Anyway, the point is, we recorded all the raw back tombs. We did a, 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 a map of the area, and uh, literally counted every tomb, and then recorded the surface. The idea is then to go back and count them every year and see how many tombs have been robbed, but it's also important to excavate, and we did excavate. And here we are excavating directly across the police post. In fact, the first time we went there, I went to the police and they said, let them, not us, but the, the work, the tomb robbing. I said, they're robbing the tomb here. They said, no, let them work, let them work. Obviously, there's some healing going on. So that's the police post. Look at the tooths. I did it again. Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. Okay, so the reason I want to show you this is, first of all, the, uh, the location of the, uh, of the tomb directly across from the road, and then the depth of it. I think these are kind of arcosolia, deep shafts, about two meters, and they go slightly underground. Right? So that's the type of tombs, and here are the drawings. This is a, a very typical example, how they were, and they're just like the Qumran ones. So uh, we began then to associate this to the Qumran burials. And we had you know, a royal visit from Joram Safir and Mitya Hirschfeld, and um, they're all now not with us. And uh, the other one, not the right thing. But anyway, the Israelis got very excited about this. But I said, look, there's no indication that these were Jewish burials. But the, the, the type of the uh, type of pack bricks here, mud bricks, adobe, uh, led to you know them being anaerobic. There's no air, so that the, the textiles uh, survive. Now, remember you saw the fragments of Masada. Um, I contacted a uh, hero Bridget Taylor, who still is working on Masada material. And I said, what period do you think these are? And she said, they're the same period as Masada. And you'll see it in a moment. So these are some of the textiles that are not in the best of shape. This was a mother and her child in his tomb, wrapped. There are two, two sets of uh, textiles here and a belt. Um, uh, and there's also leather, uh, leather shrouds here, stitch, you can see the stitching. So there's, te there's textile and then there's body bags of leather. Now these, the textiles were reused, they were closed, reused, but the, the leather is, uh, was actually very interesting. And unfortunately, we only studied this, but we have um, And the reconstruction of, now there's more that have come up in, 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 in excavations. Uh, and the French have been digging some tombs in the day of Sala in the same period. And this is the way that they reconstructed it. So, very similar also to the type, same period as, as, the, as the Fayum uh, mummy, mummies and, uh, and in Saudi Arabia, the day of Sala, and Kuzon, and now also in Petra itself. But because Petra is wet, wetter, they haven't survived. But down here, we have very good. Uh, uh, survival, and I think this reconstruction is uh, from our French colleagues is 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 very good and probably correct. Um, and again, now showing you a number of other sites where they had similar types of burials, um, like the ones we have, also Kumran, Beit Shafaf, and other sites now, which is coming up. And the conclusion. That I, we are coming to is it's not necessarily Jewish, it's just typical of a Dead Sea area. So now we have a Dead Sea type of burial, or at least in the area uh, of the Dead Sea, is this type of burial that's in the South. Well, once the, obviously the media started hearing about this, it's, it, it, it got in the newspapers, both in Jordan and uh, this is the in the French, and other magazines, uh, biblical archaeologists talking about the site. 
it became quite um, uh, interesting. People are interested. The finds from the site, because again, we're trying to date it, it was very difficult because there weren't really many objects in this, but in, in the tombs, except for jewelry, which was pretty typical first, second century, and the pottery was in Japan. So that was fine. It went along with the uh, textile period. Then we had some, some, some um, grave markers, and they also fit in with this kind of Nevitian kind of uh, like Betils or, or, or Nefesh kind of signs, even on bricks. And they're very similar to ones we find in Petra and Kavitavian, which is just up on the plateau in Jordan. So I'm calling this, I have called it, a Nevitian uh, settlement, cemetery. Uh, we another uh, inscription now. There were some inscriptions that come up. This one here, which was from the site uh, in Greek, in uh, Apsani Kali, but I think Apsani is actually a Semitic name, but Kali is the good one. So that we found. But these two pieces I saw and photographed. And I had them in my hands. I took them to the British Museum and photographed them. And then I probably should not have given them back to. Mr. Musayev, who uh, he said, I didn't think you were going to come back. <laughs> I shouldn't have brought them back. But it was his private collection. He had bought them. And they said it was a site near Babadra. You know, it was unknown, the site. I'm, I'm almost 100% sure it's um, it's the site, our site of Hubert and so on. These have now been published by um, John. Um, Shigman's name is very famous, Shigman's. And they're published, uh, they mention the dates uh, in the edition in Bosra, they're in Greek. Um, unfortunately, it's in a private collection, but I did get to photograph them and they are now uh, published. So I will refer to them as possibly, if not probably, coming from this side. But again, this problem about tomb robbing and how things are, and how do you trace them down? Well, I was lucky to trace them there, but you can't always do that. So it's detective work. It's really detective work. Um, um, the site then, I got two seasons of, of work uh, from the British Museum, but again, everybody wants something. Here we get realities. The British Museum wanted some textile, they wanted some objects. The Jordanians didn't seem to care very much. But once we uh, did uh, analysis here, here's Ranger Taylor, who works in Masada, also here, we started to lay out our pieces. Our pieces were complete, I mean, very large pieces. Uh, I did a presentation to the British Museum trustees, and it might honor to have this particular trustee ask about the project. You may recognize him in his earlier days. Um, uh, <laughs> Richard at uh, Attenborough, Sir Attenborough. Uh, and uh, then they made a deal with the Jordanian government, uh, where 12 of them were concerned, six would stay in Jordan, the other six uh, uh, would, would, would go, stay in the British Museum, you know, would, would go in Jordan. So these are the ones in Jordan, uh, in the British Museum, and these are the ones in, in, in the Museum in Safi. But there are many other pieces that need to be worked on, uh, and we did continued excavations, so and we've come up with more. Such as this complete shawl here, which was taken to Greece. I took it to Greece. It was conserved. Your hero again is studying it. This is at its conservation. And this is now returning to Jordan. It's on exhibit. So a complete shawl, uh, again, of this period. We have 53, actually, we've got 57 pieces, but this was number 53. A very important collection, again, from late Roman textiles. These are two pieces which are on the Jordan Museum, these here. Uh, and you can see uh, the pieces in Jordan and the pieces in the museum. These are the panels which ex explain the importance of these textiles. And you can see here where well, our, our analysis on the weave types and the dyes and the styles, and they are just like the portraits. Um, very important collection after Masada and Palmyra, and of course, Fayoum. So we've got Fayoum, Masada. Omara, and now this site here, not very well known. The site pieces here are com mostly complete and there's probably more underground. I tried to kind of explain the style of it, as I said before, um, 
even uh, that it's a fashion that's not necessarily associated to one cultural group, um, even though you have uh, the synagogue in Damascus showing this type of dress, in Greece you have this type of dress, and even uh, even uh, the, the Virgin Mary is, who was a weaver is dressed in this kind of um, uh, shawl and clothing that we have. It's basically a style of the period, whether they're Jews, Arabs, Greeks, Romans. It's not, and this is how I hear Branch Taylor is explain, it's not uh, necessarily associated to a religion or even an ethnic group. It's like wearing blue jeans today. It's a style. So that's one of our major conclusions. And we try to explain that to the local uh, people who visit. Uh, but there is another phase to the project, and that was what we've identified as a, is a Christian period. So these same cemeteries, these people, the Nevitaeans, which we know from Petra and other sites, became Christian. And we have tombstones that mention Nevitaean names, which you see, which are uh, Christian. So there's a continuity. And here are some of the early tombstones from Kibbit Gazan from the fourth century with very rudimentary crosses. Here are the Alpha and Omega and the uh, palm branch. Here another kind of part of the cross, very, very you know, early Christian symbols. And uh, just to make the point that it's not the only site, very similar stuff found in Kibbit Davia, again in, in southern Jordan, very similar. These are published. Uh, with Greek and, and kind of similar kind of simple crosses. So we've got parallels that this community is continuing. Then across the street, the bulldozers discovered this. So the local inspector who excavated this behind the bulldozers or in front of the bulldozers uh, called this the Kazon Church because he didn't have any other name. Uh, and as you can see here, it's quite intricate. It has some Greek inscriptions. No dates, but it's obviously showing that there's this continuity of the people that were Nabataeans into the Christian period. So we've got Nabataean religious markings, we've got the Christian markings, which associate with community identity being uh, Nabataean and then Christian. Now, there are other sites of this period in the Dead Sea area. There's this place here, which is sadly uh, owned. Uh, in private farmland, which is not exactly bulldozed but plowed. Uh, if you try to go there, they, well, you can't go there, there's no fence around it. But they must have found stuff because this stuff here was shown to me. I took photographs of it and then it went. Uh, this uh, they managed to manage to reconstruct it in the museum and have a bowl. This also we managed to get in the museum and very sure it would be found on the ground. Now, this has not been excavated. This is the Rosafi, the Dead Sea, the Wadi al Hassa. It's this place here called the uh, Ar Rama, which means the sandy land of Mr. Rabbi or the family Rabbi. That's I, I baptized it. Just you have to give names to sites. So, unfortunately, this site, well, I don't know if we can work there, but it's private property. Uh, another site which has been pretty much destroyed is part of this, the north, a site called Sakin, which again, farmland and sheep. This is the only piece which I was able to kind of save and take to a, a museum. But similar kind of burial tombs, which I photographed and are now pulled out, you know, probably the same period. Um, another extension of the road, uh, the main road that's going down to, from the north to south and the east side. There is a, a small fortress, and by it, there are some tombs which were robbed and then uh, uh, and then uh, partially excavated. Um, and it forms a number of uh, forts, castle and castan, uh, cast, castles and forts all along the Dead Sea, going all the way down to Aqaba Island of, of, of the Roman period. So there's a, someone's interested in doing a network of forts. There's a study there waiting to be done, but many of these forts, which also have these tombs next to them, uh, another one a bit farther south, which was preserved by chance because it's an Islamic uh, graveyard there. So there is another you know, Roman, but we can't leave that out in Islamic. But on top is very robbed out, as you can see here, 
these are early Bronze Age, this 5,000 year old site of Thetha. So they go through the Bronze Age, but they seem to have missed this. Don't tell them. Um, there was another site when the Jordan Ministry of uh, Water Authority wanted to build in Kunizera, farther south, uh, big water tanks for the irrigation. And they came across archaeological sites. Unfortunately, the Department of Antiquity did rescue work there and came up with similar tombs to Kazan. Here you have these similar types of tombs and similar types of objects like these gold earrings, some leather sandals, a wooden coffin. Um, so there are a number of other sites in the Dead Sea area of this period. Now, up above this area, we have a fantastic fortification, which is not as big as Masada, but it's comparable and just across on the eastern side. It's called the Umtawabi, the mother of bread ovens, because these circular things here, they didn't know what to call it. They didn't know what the site could be called, so they call it the Thalus bread ovens. They could be uh, tent encampments, or they could be, it still hasn't been ultimately decided, but some of the excavations that we have done have come up with some Middle Bronze Age pottery and walls. Uh, the fort above of a huge wall is definitely first, second century Roman Nabataean period. It's mentioned in the Notitia de Tutapen as being having a cavalry unit. Uh, we did some limited work here, unfortunately. You work there, it's difficult, and then you go away and the tomb robbers come in. So when we were there in December, we already came up with mashed up stuff and a very interesting inscription, which I don't know what it is, but the point is, if we're going to work in an area, we have to be committed to it. Otherwise, we attract attention and then it gets destroyed. So this is a reality where if you're going to work in an area, and the Jordanians realize this, and that's why they're saying now it's not you shouldn't dig a site unless you have a long-term commitment. No further comment. This is the site as far as Marshall is concerned. We came up uh, on a number of forts, not just one major one. We came up with an incense burner with a Nebuchadnezzar inscription. Fine. Nebuchadnezzar would trade in incense and perfect. A fragment of a horse, which may be similar to this one here, it's in the room. But uh, and some other things. We also have wall plaster, which is similar to wall plaster in the saga. Uh, but very little amount of finds, very little amount of pottery. But I think great potential of someone who's willing to go up there. This fort here, uh, our recent report shows that it could might be even Iron Age. Middle, no, yeah, Iron Age. Uh, some of the tombstones that we found in Galara, the wealth of, the, of information, but these two actually mention military officers, a, a, a soldier and a, and a, and a, and a standard bearer, Nacomiarius uh, and the Rathcurtus. Uh, um, so obviously, Zoara, the cemetery below, is connected with this fortress. And, um, another site which has uh, is Dera Nevada. It wasn't, it wasn't known when it was went there, but we baptized it Dera Nevada. And there's many little Bronze Age tombs and the sanctuary of Lot, the monastery, and some uh, around the spring, uh, some Mediterranean uh, material, some unrobbed tombs, which is again is a bit. And in the cave, there is also some. Uh, Hellenistic, as you see here, fairly nice Hellenistic and Nabataean pottery, including this Megarian bowl uh, and Hellenistic uh, pottery. This was found in the cave. These are publishers, but showing you that there is this continuity in the first century BC AD. Um, and this is the cave of Sanctuary of Lot, which was a major project that I discovered and finished and restored. And, this is not fully published. If anybody wants a copy, they have to come to Jordan to get it. <laughs> or at least you can ask somebody to carry it. It's, uh, but this project was finished and it led to the projects that I've been doing since the 1980s. Um, it's a typical early Christian monastery uh, with a church, a living area for the monks, water, a reservoir, and gardens around the vegetable. And we were very lucky to have inscriptions dated 
605, 691, and uh, one more, 654, or the 546. Anyway, we're very lucky to have inscriptions on the mosaics, also inscriptions on the stone, and uh, all published and very lucky to have the site. But the reality was, oh, sorry, the reality was, as you saw maybe in the earlier photographs, you see this here. The reason we found it is because from the road, they were going up with a bulldozer, trying to collect antiquities. So these are bulldozers, and they did take, they must have taken some antiquities. And the late father, Michele Picciarillo, has said that he, this is an Italian company here called the Crescent Building Contractor. And he, he saw in Milano many things from the area which were taken and they were exported, obviously illegally, but they're in Italy. One day they'll come in the market, or maybe some family members will decide to donate it. But there are in Italy quite a lot of material from the Laura Safi. Father Picciarillo says there is a museum of the Laura Safi in Milano, you know, in private homes. This is the reality, right? We're dealing with realities. Okay. Uh, another small harmony inside which we survey, and this has been rubbed out very badly, as you can see here. Uh, we cleaned it out and planned it, but it needs more work. In fact, all this soil could be sieved and probably you get pottery and, and other things, maybe reconstructible, because as you can see here, it's been rubbed out. There's a double tomb here, and this is the section of bronze that we've done. It needs to be redone. But one thing they did not destroy is the little piece here, which actually has an inscription. And it says, you know, dear Lord, bless this place. But we don't know what it is. Possibly a holy man, like, you know, like, like this, living up here in the cave. But this could be excavated and sealed because it's wall and it's fallen down. Uh, uh, and, you know, if you do it carefully, you could maybe reconstruct it. Considering it was an inscription, there could be more. I think it's a, Nice, it's a nice example of early Christian hermitage, a small chapel, this little niche. Um, another uh, early Christian hermitage on the Psalm is the Dead Sea, this is the west of Israel Palestine. And here you've got two monastic areas. Unfortunately, this mosaic is completely destroyed, it's already cut by bulldozers. Um, but there's not, I think there's virtually nothing left of this now, but it's interesting to visit. Hermitage on the Lisan, and of course, the Lara itself, the site which we talked about, mentioned, and focus of our work and future work. And here we go for the future. Uh, it's mentioned in the Babatha archives, the Lady Babatha in uh, from, from the, uh, from, the uh, uh, from the west, from the cage in the west. And here it mentions Zohar, Zohar on. So this is the document that says that she has property there. And this is Zohar on the Magdalena with the word desert, animals, and the Dead Sea. And the photograph you saw in the beginning, it you know, very close. Like okay. Uh, it's very nicely depicted on the Magdalena. And in reality, they too do that palm trees, and it's really, um, again, the reality of how it was and how it is today. And now the major site is in this agricultural area, unfortunately being destroyed probably only every day. We've come up with another church, which is bulldozed, but not planned, it needs to be planned. Um, uh, we've also worked out, or well, there is a work, or there is a road network. This is the Morisaki in the Hassa. And the Dead Sea. This is the area of modern, uh, modern Safi and ancient Zawara, including the Iron Age city. There's a lot of material, and I need to finish up. It's been over an hour. Uh, uh, the roads, you can see the road networks here, very well built, probably imperial type roads. And then are the ports in the Dead Sea. A number of ports, as you can see here in the west. Which have been identified: Zohara, Mahotsin, Nisada, Ngedi, Mazin, Kaliyot, Acheres, and some rock, some drawings, both in Qumran and Nisada, showing boats. So there's obviously connections east-west. But even more recently, during the late Ottoman period, there was a postal route that was going from from uh, Jerusalem 
to Jericho region, Bahar, and then across to Haditha. And this is one of the last Ottoman period uh, boats crossing the Dead Sea, which now has disappeared, but I have the photograph. And again, the bottom of the map, which shows the two boats. One of the tombs we have shows also one of these boats with green oars. So plenty of boat activity across the Dead Sea. And then this great cemetery, which we made a very, uh, not very official map, but just by talking to the local people, because they live here and they, well, they build their house and they find tombs and they sell the stuff since the department, or at least the authorities haven't paid much attention until recently. So we mapped out Bronze Age, Christian, Byzantine, and Jewish, uh, Jewish Byzantine period stones. This is one of the most colorful ones, which is in the cover of, of our recently published volume two. And a, a selection of some of the tombstones showing you uh, uh, the, in Greek the survival of a Nevitae named Usarios, Usara, uh, Obedianos, Obe, Obeda, Obedianos, again, another Nevitae name. And this again in Greek, but this mentions an Archisinevoros, the head of a synagogue in Greek. Unfortunately, this was photographed by myself and is out there somewhere. So I keep showing it and hopefully we'll find it. It may just be in the village somewhere, but I don't know. This was also photographed uh, uh, by myself, and it's this one was saved. It mentions the Taurus. And another important factor in this, uh, it, it, this person came from Sephoris, which is in Galilee. Another important part of these inscriptions is that it shows people coming from all over the place from Petra, Galilee, Udru, uh, and settling, working there and dying there. So we have a lot of information, a lot of good dating, uh, including the, the earthquake of 363. But there are also fakes because, particularly the ones that are the Jewish ones, uh, have their, their, their on sale in the markets. In the local markets, people come down from Kerak or Oman or out of the where. So the local people uh, are not so stupid and they've started to uh, make them. So these are uh, some photographs that we've taken of ones that were obviously fakes. Uh, unfortunately, the Department of Antiquities is. Is registered piece, but they're not real. I'll actually put this in the publication as an example of a fake because you can't read it. But, they, but what's interesting is they've actually been copying something. So, uh, yeah, so fakes are now entering the market locally. And I'll have to go quickly now. The medieval period is lots of. Uh, uh, writers which mentions or I just want to read about, but here it is on a very important map um, from the 12th century, uh, showing you Zorara. Um, it was made, Al Idrisi, uh, uh, map maker was made, it has, it has a whole world. This focuses on the Dead Sea, as you can see here. The Dead Sea is around Europe, it's not exactly as it looks, but it's, it's an important map of the 12th century. And many writers up until the 12th century are mentioning Zawara or the area. We also have the Vene kind of Veneza mentions uh, that the best quality indigo to make the, the tetlet dye for the tassel, the titian tassel, were brought from Zawara. So the indigo industry was obviously, well, was well known historically. Our excavations came up with two pots like this, which are which I, I concluded are for indigo processing. They had a hole, you would collect the plants, you would rock them, and you would then, when it's rotted, you dry it and you use this concentration, this chemical concentration of the plants to dye clothes. And we have also some uh, indigo crucibles. Which we put the kind of uh, as a mold for the little very valuable indigo uh, blue dye. Uh, and I got this from parallels in the British whoops, 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 from the British Museum and the Victoria Health Museum, which have these similar kind of uh, crucibles from the Khorasan in, 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 in Iran. So that's my parallels. Um, and then continuity of this kind of chemical industry 
processing of plants for, for, for commercial use is the sugar from sugar cane. And this is the large sugar, sugar cane pressing factory that we have in, in, in again, in the area of the Lara Borisati. Very important, uh, the whole Jordan Valley, in fact, was in the big factory for producing sugar cane, and they made lots of money selling it to silly Europeans who wanted to put it in their tea. <laughs> Uh, and here we, towards the end of the project, we we put uh, a signage up, thanks to the USA, American uh, USA, and we put some walkways and we tried to do some uh, restorations. And here I am sharing it to the American ambassador who came to visit the site. Uh, unfortunately, the site is being constantly damaged, so there is more excavation that could be done. But it's a, an interesting site in Jordan because you don't have other kinds of industrial complexes. So the Jordanians are quite interesting. The site had been completely damaged, but they were just redone by the USA, the Americans, and the center. Um, we've also been doing uh, training, or we have them, again, training for pottery sorting, pottery restoration. These are things that have been done, especially because of the, the facilities that have been made. We try to involve the locals both in putting up some of the inscriptions here in this local museum, and even making uh, uh, making copies now of modern uh, modern copies of mosaics. Um, but the reality is is that the local people, the two mothers, they're not bad people, as you can see here. Mothers and their children and their you know you know young people just trying to to, to make a living. And if they're not being stopped, now this is an old photograph, but still it is going on today. And the kind of things they show you immediately are beautiful black vessels, jewelry, including gold rings. And it's really sad, but unless archaeologists excavate, they're going to excavate. So it's a matter of who gets there first. And of course, now this is again old, it's about 15 years old, but they're advertised. These pottery are definitely coming. They're very identifiable. These cups are coming from Borisaki. This is from Baba Dra. It's Bronze Age. And they, they look how they market them biblically. The thing is, they talk out of the country. This stuff is taken from the Dead Sea area and it's sold in the markets in London and Jerusalem, uh, but uh, mostly in, in Europe. And this is the reality. And you can see the prices. You know, the American price, not so much, it's only $30 or $50 or $10. Um, um, now, I, when I attended a conference in, in a World Archaeological Conference about this, and you can see our photograph was on the cover of the book, uh, Illicit Antiquities. So it, I think all of us as archaeologists and historians or academics need to you know, bring the awareness of not only the local community, but also the international community that we shouldn't encourage and we shouldn't buy these antiquities. I'm not saying us here, but the people out there who Think nothing of buying, let's say, an antiquity. Um, so, what can you do? You do public relations campaigns. You, the local governments and, and us, also need to protect the sites. This is a protective fence. But it really is a battle between us and the tomb owners. Um, okay, then in special exhibitions or informative exhibitions, such as this fantastic uh, Dead Sea Panorama complex, which doesn't have antiquities, but you can see here the Japanese paid about five million to build this. Fantastic viewpoint over the Dead Sea, which is mostly geological, but it's good to have these because it gives awareness to the community. But more specifically, establishing new site museums. Now, this is our uh, newly established, well, it's about 10 years old, Museum Whoops at the lowest place on Earth. And in, in a couple of weeks, whoops, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button. In a couple of weeks, we'll be seeking the accommodations there. So this is a museum which we designed now for exhibition as a workspace, external, uh, uh, but also uh, places for archaeologists to, to live uh, and work. And that's very important. And this is the inside of the museum, showing the stories, the stories of the Bible, the stories of sugar in Arabic and English. This is what it looks like from the outside. Um, this is what it looks like from the inside. Of course, it needs improving. We've now upgraded it, but we need to constantly upgrade the museum exhibition. And then to have an engaging local uh, local uh, people. Uh, again, this was at the director of antiquities and the 
and the American ambassador. This is with the local school group showing me the mummy, which was very attractive. They took it off the exhibition. Then the locals said, well, we want to see it. So it came back on the exhibition. Uh, the World Archaeological Congress, uh, you might see people here, you know, we had a big setting there in the museum, so it was on that. And local school groups visiting some of the sites. Um, we local training, a very important mosaic conservation training with the local people. And also, uh, we started a project with where they're making designs based on ancient uh, mosaics and also the indigo industry, the design industry. Now, on the 21st of February, that was what, uh, less than a month ago, Queen Rania of Jordan visited uh, the Religion Project. If we have time, there's a two minute video, which is very nice. Can we, is there time? It's very pleasant. <laughs> um, but how do I do it? How do I put uh, the YouTube thing? It's, it shows how we, we, use the archaeological work we've done for the indigo industry uh, and the information we got uh, and the local information from uh, uh, from, from what the people have done with with support from UNESCO to revitalize the production of indigo dye, which was if it doesn't work it's it doesn't work no uh, it needs to go on YouTube and you know it's okay I can if people are interested I can always send it to them if you click that, you wouldn't do it. Which one? If you go to the slide. Yeah, I did it. Oh, it didn't do it? No. There's probably a way of doing it, but it should say... Like you, that, you can't yeah. click that? Just click it. There you go. Oh. Why don't you just choose one? What is that? Choose that one. Oh, there you go. Oh, um, no. That's good to spend about three, three, three seconds. seconds. Okay. okay. Make it bigger. Just make it bigger. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, there's no sound though. There's no sound. It is, but not that. Anyway, it's I'm virtually finished. I thought it. This is not it. But obviously, it's not it. No. Ah, oh, there's no sound. No sound. Okay. Well, um, it's basically, like it's it's just it's it's actually explaining. Oh, you know what? Actually, they're speaking in Arabic underneath the sheet in English. No, there's no subtitle. Right? This is, it's okay. Basically, oh, there you go. So they're speaking in Arabic and there's nice music, but you know, it's basically talking about the project and how we revitalize an ancient tradition to something modern. And well, there you go. You can, uh, you can read it fast enough. First, we used uh, soil dyes, including soil from Petra to make it pink. Uh, gray was from the Dead Sea, mud, and uh, soils. And these are permanent dyes. They're not vegetable dyes. And then we did this project with the indigo. This is the indigo plant. They collected them. They stopped using sand. And they started doing this uh, indigo dye. Indigo is the product from India. Indigo, India in Greek. So it's something developed in India. They brought the plant. These are the plants. And they will rot them in those big jars. And then it's becomes you know, the solid block and then they die. The, um, so it's great to have something ancient, traditional, medieval, uh, redeveloped, that's indigo plants, on the site. And that way we have something living and modern. Here are the, uh, uh, there the back, and these are plastic, but it's similar to what we had, the pottery, big pots. And they're using their skills in, there you go, that's the indigo, and that's the petri soils. And we trained them, and they're doing it all by themselves now. And it's so successful that, as you saw, even Queen Rania went. And they sell these. Some of these designs are based on mosaics, some of them are. Of course, you need to go help them organize their management and all this kind of stuff. This is the head of the, the project. And uh, Oh. And there's the rotting. There it is. That, that's the that's the dye. So like they do it on cotton. Most I think on cotton it dyes and other colors. Okay. 
Anyway. Okay. All right. Um, I just have one last thing and then we're done. Sorry, it's it's gone for a long time, but I was told I could do one. <laughs> Can you just go? There's like there's one more, I think. Uh, so just go out and maybe. Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, there. So that's pretty Oh, you like this first step? Okay. In the museum, they're all sold out products, which is nice. If you connect between the antiquity, the modern shop, and the local people, and all these ladies are actually related to the workers. So we, the way of really keeping it alive and keeping the people. And there's also a new thing which they started by themselves. It's called Sunny Kitchen. You go and you collect your plants. I think this is like the Mexican ambassador or something. One day you collect your food and then you cook it. They teach you how to cook it. They do it in Petra too, the Petra Kitchen. So they do this locally and uh, you know you basically pay to cook your own food. <laughs> but they're trying to think of ways to um, to keep it alive. And um, Okay, it's being hidden by that thing, but this is making daily life in 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 the Dead Sea area and showing you different um, different things. And then the future studies of the Dead Sea. This is the many sites of the Lorisati, and we hope there's a future there. And there's a possibility also of another project in Manzara in Kaliroi or the north. So this is some of the future, at least our possible future, hopefully, inshallah. Of the Dead Sea, and this is it's being hidden, but it's a Dead Sea, the lowest place on Earth, and that's the view of the museum at night. Thank you for your attention over this long talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, you know, for the theory of the archaeology of Jordan, specifically the army of Zohar. But uh, thank you for the uh, past, future, and uh, reality, uh, which has different faces. Uh, one connected with uh, engaging with local people, another was the other kind of engagement, and it was uh, robbery. But uh, still, it's reality. And thank you for that. You have a question. Do you have a few uh, minutes to ask questions? Do not hesitate to ask them and give us. We have the opportunity to ask. I'm more than happy. I mean, it's a lot of material. I have two questions. One uh, concerning the pardon, uh, uh, the tombs, past tombs, and you made it uh, I go so great. Well, I, 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 I don't, uh, what do you think? I mean, maybe it's, uh, you don't agree with that? I know that. Perfect. They are always with the arch. I see. Well, and because it's go to no, they're not arch, but it kind of goes to the it goes to the right. If if, if you think, I mean, I'm I'll, if you know more than I do, I'm happy to correct. This is not published yet, but well, I actually did put it in the publication, but it's not final. But if you think that's wrong, oh, because of arco means arch, is that what it is? Think about. It. I gave it that name. I mentioned that name, but if it's incorrect. I'm very happy to take your uh, advice, but I was trying to describe how you this, this type of tomb, which goes slightly to the um, to the right. So arcosolia, you think, is not the right term? I'm not a Latin Roman archaeologist, but would you say that's not the right term? Okay, thank you. Oh. And another question: This church. Also, at all, uh, why should it be a church? It could be a synagogue. Well, the eighth is the only indication, uh, and the mosaic. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. The, the, the mosaics. There's there's lots of cross. There's crosses. There's a number of crosses. I didn't show you the all the and the, and the inscriptions are. There's a number of inscriptions in Greek. No, I think it's quite clearly a church. Okay. It's not, uh, yeah, it's quite clearly a church. I mean, there's a number of crosses there. And it's it's not just that one apse. There are there are two side aisles, which also have inscriptions. And they basically mention the benefit. It's actually published in the in the uh, the um, the current Zoara 2 volume. 
So it's actually, you see the, all the inscriptions are actually also published and they're all, I mean, Greek Christian inscriptions. Is it the date in the inscription? In there is the no date in that one, no. There's no date. Well, there might have been a date in the front, but the bulldozer took it out. But it's it's. it's I, I think that's that. I will probably insist it's a church. Thank you. One more question. Or comments or corrections? Yeah. Thank you for the most inspiring talk. Thank you for your job. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned a connection between the salt of the sea and pepper. Could you well, tell us the, a little bit more about that? Well, I was walking about 15 years ago. I took the photograph. There were bags of salt. And I actually asked some of the better ones. said, yeah, they get that from the Dead Sea and they give it to the animals to eat. They put it, or they put it in the food for the animals, for the, for the, for the, so for the horse, donkeys, horses, a camel. So they actually feed it to the animals. That's what they said, but there were bags of salt. No, they, I, that's that's what they said, and there's no salt up in Petra, not bags. So they bring it up. They also bring other things like antiquities to Petra. You, you can see them; the stuff that you can see are coming from there. Am I right that the cave of San Carlos is in charge? Am I right that the cave of San Carlos is in charge? Is there any indication that the cave was used before the Christian church? Yes, but I had so much material here. I couldn't. It's it's the cave is not behind. Well, it's it's actually the, the church is built over it, and it's the cave is the relic. You know. In early Christianity, you need some relic, and there's no relic there, but the, it's this was the holy spot. This is where people came, and we had lots of graffiti, crosses, but also Arabic. Uh, even during Islam, they were going there, really, you know, obviously praying for a lot. But the inscriptions we have three which actually say lot, say lot. We took the floor out at one point and in the cave, and that's where we found the late Hellenistic pottery that you, I showed it, and also. Um, a, a, a calcite vessel from Yemen, so there is the connection for sure. Uh, but then we went farther down, and in the back of the cave, we went down and we found Middle Bronze Age, very nice pottery, and then Early Bronze Age settlement with a burial in the back, flints. We did charcoal uh, dating, and that was Early Bronze Age. Um, it did, it did four, I think I said. The point is. And also, there was the same case. If you're interested in Christianity now, in the in the in the other monastery in the Lisan that I showed you, where it was destroyed, is that they uh, in the in Lot's thing, the early Christians when they went to build the church must have seen also these pots, and they must have. I think they probably built that thinking, oh, this is the pots of of, of the Lot in the Lisan. They had taken a pot from the Bronze Age from Baba Dra, I think. The, and they had put it in in the in the in the in, below the mosaic. They actually buried it ceremoniously. So it's interesting that they are conscious of something before them. We look at early Christianity as archaeology, but then they are also looking back, and they use this the early Bronze Age to justify uh, this is the Old Testament sites. I I think it's fascinating. I put those in the museum, by the way. They're in the pots are in the museum, and I mentioned this. So it's fascinating that the early Christians were looking farther back. And yeah, so there's lots in the cave. And actually, there's more because we didn't take everything out. Regarding the two stones from Yorosaki with Aramaic and Greek inscriptions, have you physically located the site from which? In which the population was very Catholic. I mean, well, it's the it, the, the they are, they are so Arab, but is it located? Yeah, the tombs are all there. They're robbed out, mostly robbed out, unfortunately. Some we found kind of in situ, but the the people are, you know, digging them up. So it's 
it's a mess. But they are definitely from there, and the dates are perfectly dated to the same period. So the pottery and the other finds are exactly the, the, the right date. I, I, you mean I, 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 the, this domain which those people? Um, well, it's yes, because we have at this point two churches. There's probably at least another couple of churches from the sixth, from the fifth, sixth century, and the same date as the inscriptions, and some of the mosaics. Do have a date of the same period. So the settlement is there. The only problem with that settlement is that you have the later Islamic period is also settling in the same area. So it's a bit of a mix. But the mosaics from, from the churches have the same date as the tombstones. But they also have a Jewish quarter. Yes, and that's why I showed you this area, which the local people, I was just talking to them. And they identified the area. It's all houses now. They would like dig underneath their house and they would find things. And there is one stone, which is now just published also in Zoratu, which was a lintel stone with a, with the menorah. I, I mean, I think it's it was, yeah, I don't remember the dimensions, but it was a lintel. So it was, could have been from a synagogue. Unfortunately, we took the photograph in 2008 and it's disappeared. So, but at least we had the photograph. So yeah, there's a Jewish community. There's uh, one lintel stone, but also we have some other stones just with menorahs that might have been from a synagogue. And there might be some building, which is a synagogue eventually there, but it's underneath agricultural fields. It's a little bit complicated because of the agriculture. Yeah. No I'd like to ask uh, about the uh, water crafts. Uh, what do you think about the size uh, of the water crafts, the boats or the ships? Uh, uh, selling them? We may base, of course, on the, <laughs> but they are well, tricky, I think. It's not a stable ground because it's connected to the this, I don't know. I mean, the, so they... but the size of the entrance to the, to the uh, power. Oh, the Kibbut Mazen. Yeah, we have to look at the archaeology there. Uh, yeah, especially that, that one in the West. I have never been there, but uh, I'm hoping to go sometime. But the reports should have the size of that. Yeah. So the size, of course, the, for the boats to go in. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise... I don't know how you would do I, I suspect somebody might have done some work in Israel, maybe, on boats, or comparing it to boats from other areas. I don't know. Well, there's the boat in Galilee that was, uh, wasn't there a boat? So maybe, maybe, but I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on boats. Other questions, please? I would like to underline once again that uh, uh, the sites which were presented during today's lecture were excavated in great majority by continuous uh, by himself. So it's uh, worth to, uh, to, to mention it once again. Thank you so much, Dan, and uh, thank you to all the audience, to the listeners. Uh, today uh, it's, uh, the conference is finished, but tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, actually, maybe they will continue. As well, so you're all, all uh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay.